This hearing is the committee's second hearing following the Supreme Court's McCutcheon decision earlier this year that looks at issues surrounding money in our political system. In April, the committee met to hear from a panel of experts about the McCutcheon decision and how our campaign finance landscape has changed in recent years. We know that McCutcheon, coupled with the Citizens United decision, have created an, an environment where we'll see records amounts of money spent to influence elections around the country. Today's hearing will focus uh, specifically on the issue of campaign finance in American politics and the need for expanded disclosure. Chairman Schumer wanted to be here today but was unable to attend. He has a statement that, uh, without objection, uh, shall be entered into the record. Our constitutional system contains many provisions that are in tension with one another, important provisions which often touch our basic rights and responsibilities in sometimes conflicting and contradictory ways. One of these, which I wrestle with daily as a member of the Intelligence Committee, for example, is the tension between the fundamental charge of the preamble that we are to provide for the common defense and ensure the domestic tranquility, while at the same time observing the privacy protections of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. Another example is the subject of today's hearing. How do we respect and enhance the freedom of expression enshrined in the First Amendment while protecting the government from being corrupted by the unchecked flow of money to public officials? We've wrestled with this problem for well over 100 years through periodic scandals and periodic corrections new laws and new ways to evade those laws. But as I observed at the outset of our committee's hearing on this subject several months ago, we have never seen anything like what is happening today. The average senator now must raise more than $5,000 a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for six years in order to be prepared for the next election. But as disheartening as that is, it's only part of the story. Over the last decade and accelerating in the last four or five years is a new phenomenon, the unchecked, unlimited, undisclosed gusher of money from individuals, interest groups, and shadowy organizations that has become a kind of parallel universe of essentially unregulated campaign cash. In recent years, the Supreme Court has steadily chipped away at two of the three pillars of the campaign finance regulation concept which goes back to the early days of the last century and has effectively eliminated limits on sources and amounts. But the court's fundamental basis for doing so was the assumption that the third pillar, disclosure of the source of contributions, remained as a bulwark against corruption which would otherwise threaten the heart of our political process. Justice Roberts in the McCutcheon case said, disclosure of contributions minimizes the potential for abuse of the campaign finance system. Disclosure requirements are in part justified based upon a governmental interest in providing the electorate with information about the sources of election-related spending. They may also deter actual corruption and avoid the appearance of corruption by exposing large contributions and expenditures to the light of publicity. That's Justice Roberts. And he makes total sense. But sadly, this kind of disclosure, the disclosure which the court relied upon as a principal justification for the McCutcheon and Citizens United decision simply doesn't exist under today's campaign finance laws. And the result is an almost total loss of accountability, the, hide, the hiding of vital information from voters, who it is that's trying to influence their votes, and an inevitable slide toward corruption and scandal. I know that many consider this a partisan issue. I do not. Although the momentary advantage under the present system appears to favor the Republicans, the whim of a couple of liberal billionaires could change that perception overnight. This is a systemic issue, which should be fixed with an eye to the long-term health of our democracy, not a fine calculation of who might gain an edge in the next election. Today, we meet to consider a bill to remedy this shortfall. Senator Whitehouse has been a leader on this issue for many years. His, if, his bill is not the only bill. I also have a bill, the Real-Time Transparency Act, 
that would require members of Congress, PACs, and political committees to report $1,000 donations electronically within 48 hours. Probably the purest form of free political speech in America is the traditional New England town meeting. It's a place where citizens from all walks of life gather together, usually on a cool Saturday morning in early March, to debate, argue, and decide the school budget, whether to buy a new police cruiser or which roads will be paved in the coming year. I've been to those meetings in Maine, and I've heard the spirited debates and seen some folks go home angry and hurt when their point of view didn't prevail. But everyone speaks up for themselves in Maine, and I've never seen someone stand to speak in disguise. I've never seen someone stand to speak in disguise. We know who's doing the talking, and that in itself is valuable information. And so it should be in November. Because what is an election but a big town meeting where the people decide the future of their community or their country? And an essential part of the debate, an essential part of how we make decisions is knowing who's doing the talking. Senator Roberts. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For those of us who opposed the McCain-Feingold bill, it is always an interesting experience to hear concerns being expressed about the current state of our campaign finance system. I opposed that legislation along with most of my Republican colleagues because we feared it would make our system worse, not better. We feared it would not get money out of the system, but would simply divert it to other sources. That has now come to pass. It was not hard to predict. Unfortunately, instead of recognizing the folly and the futility of the last regulatory scheme, the majority seeks to impose a new one this time under the guise of disclosure. Now that sounds harmless enough, it sounds very reasonable, especially when it is articulated by my good friend. The bill before the committee today has been introduced in one form or another in each of the last three Congresses. Though the provisions have varied in some respects, the goal has been consistent to suppress speech by imposing costly and burdensome regulations on its exercise. While other effects to achieve this goal have been struck down as unconstitutional by the courts, <clears throat> the majority has attempted to use disclosure as a means to erect a new regulatory scheme to silence their opponents. This effort must be seen in the context of their larger goal to amend the First Amendment to permit even more regulation of uh, political speech. I have here the Constitution of the United States and also the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. Also mentions the press and the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, whether it be Kansas or in New England. This effort uh, must be seen again in the context of the larger goal to amend the First Amendment to permit even more regulation of uh, political speech. I repeated that on purpose. The Judiciary Committee has reported a constitutional amendment, which our Majority Leader has said we'll be voting on in September, that would allow the Congress to impose reasonable restrictions on speech. Luckily, previous considerations of the Disclose Act provide some insight into what the majority regards as reasonable. For starters, when the Disclose Act was considered by the House in 2010, the restrictions and obligations it imposed were applied to groups disfavored by the majority. A number of corporations were simply prohibited from speaking. Government contractors and TARP recipients were prohibited from making independent expenditures. During floor consideration, an amendment was added to also prohibit speech by companies that explore and produce oil and gas on the outer continental shelf. What's that all about? Well, the bill was on the floor soon after the Deepwater Horizon spill, you see. So this was an easy target. Not surprisingly, the majority thought it was perfectly reasonable 
to prevent any of these companies from speaking, but did not think it was necessary to extend those restrictions to the unions that might represent the workforce in these companies. Republican amendments to extend the restrictions to these unions were rejected. The majority did not find them reasonable, apparently. In some cases, groups were excluded from the disclosure obligation solely because the votes were not there to include them. That is what happens once the Congress starts to impose speech restrictions. The restrictions get applied to whoever doesn't have enough votes in the Congress to prevent them. That is why the First Amendment begins, Congress shall make no law. Imposing speech regulations based on the whims of whatever party happens to be in the majority in Congress at a given time is not a reasonable uh, exercise, but it is exactly what happens once we start down this path. I give this uh, little recent history lesson, Mr. Chairman, because I think it's important we not try to fool ourselves or anybody else about what's going on here. There is no mystery about the purpose of the Disclose Act, this version or any other prior one. We know the majority is upset about the ads that are attacking them and their agenda. We know they want those ads to stop. We know they hope new disclosure requirements will achieve that goal. We know they think the requirements they want to impose are reasonable. But we just don't agree. We don't believe new regulations will improve our system. We don't think imposing new costs on the exercise of free speech rights will improve our democracy. If the IRS targeting scandal has taught us anything, it should be that giving federal bureaucrats control over the political activity of American citizens is a recipe for disaster. It is time to admit the failure of the regulatory model and reverse the mistake when we made when we passed McCain-Feingold and the Federal Election Campaign Act before it. I know my friends in the majority want to silence their opponents by any available means, but they should stop trying. New regulations will not make our system better. Getting rid of the regulations we have will. If we really want disclosure, we should be advancing proposals that will, will redirect resources to the candidates and the parties. That's long overdue. They are fully accountable and fully disclose everything they spend and receive. Getting rid of the limits on parties and candidates would increase transparency and enhance disclosure. If disclosure is the goal, that is the way to achieve it. Unfortunately, the Disclose Act has another goal, one no American who supports the Constitution should support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're pleased to have join us this morning the distinguished Republican leader, Senator McConnell. Senator McConnell, a, a statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Roberts, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about the Disclose Act, and I'll get right to it. The proposal is not new. This is the third time we've seen it, but it's precisely because of the doggedness of the proponents of this bill that I've come here today uh, to make my observations. For more than two centuries, We've had regularly scheduled elections in our country. Every two years, the major parties present a vision for the future with confidence in the people, with confidence that the marketplace of ideas, the best arguments will win out. And yet every two years now, with near metronic uh, regularity, our friends on the other side can now be expected to propose some new attempt to silence their critics. Or in the case of the Disclose Act, an old attempt to silence critics. Sadly, it's now come to the point where you can set your clock to the Democrats' attempt to stifle the free speech rights of the American people. To me, this means they've either lost confidence in the centuries-old bargain that said the best political argument will, will prevail, or they've simply lost faith in the First Amendment itself. But either way, it's now fairly clear that our friends on the other side have given up on the power of their governing vision alone to carry the day electorally. That's not just a shame, it's not just a commentary, it's, it's not just a commentary on the left, it's not simply some political stunt aimed at exciting the base in an election year, because if that's all it was, we could just dismiss it and move on. But it's actually far worse than all that. Collectively and individually, these continued efforts to weaken voter participation in our elections proposes a real threat to the right of free speech in this country, something which is guaranteed by the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, and which has ensured the integrity of the political process in this country for more than two centuries. 
We've not always lived up to the promise of the First Amendment as a nation, but we've always had recourse to it in correcting past mistakes. And no one, no one should be tampering with it. Yet again and again in recent years, that's just exactly what we've seen. We saw it on shameful display at the IRS, as detailed in the IG report on the agency's activities leading up to the 2012 election. And in the administration's subsequent efforts to codify through regulation just the kind of targeting that took place. We saw it in recent efforts by Democrats to empower Congress, as Senator Roberts pointed out, through a constitutional amendment to limit the free speech rights of individuals and groups. A truly radical proposal that would end all arguments about what little regard our friends on the other side have for the rights of free citizens to set the direction of our country. And we've seen it three times now in the biennial revival of the Disclose Act. Let me be blunt, this proposal is little more than a crude intimidation tactic masquerading as good government. And the fact that we've been forced to consider it once again is the clearest proof yet that our friends on the other side are fixated, fixated on suppressing speech. It's no secret that the First Amendment has been a consuming passion of mine for many years. I've fought hard to defend it on the Senate floor and in the highest court of the land. It has pitted me at times against members of my own party, including President Bush. And in its defense, I've occasionally formed alliances with some unlikely allies. Among them is the American Civil Liberties Union, and I'd like to ask Ms. Chairman consent to enclose a letter from the um, ACLU opposing the Disclose Act in the record at this point. Without objection. It's to the great credit of the ACLU that even though largely not aligned with most members of my party on most issues, they've stood strong in opposition to the Disclose Act. I'm grateful for their efforts on this issue yet again. Some might say that the arguments on both sides of this proposal hardly need repeating since Democrats have now proposed it on three separate occasions, but I see it differently. In my view, it is precisely when we stop speaking out against proposals like this that we're in the greatest danger of ceding our rights to those who would deprive us of them. Whenever our friends spring from behind closed doors with a bill like this one, we need to be ready to respond in kind. And in this case, the first part of that response should be to point out the obvious at a time when millions of Americans are struggling to find work, small businesses are sputtering under the weight of an increasingly brazen regulatory state our VA system is failing our veterans, and tens of thousands of unaccompanied minors have been flowing across the border without any clear policy solution from either the White House or Democratic leaders in Congress. Democratic leaders should not be focused on a bill, the primary purpose of which is to silence their critics. Their persistence at this particular moment is eloquent testimony to where the priorities lie. Second thing I'd like to say about this proposal is that the entire premise for it is utterly baseless. The supposed justification of this bill is the need to, quote, do something, end quote, about certain people and voluntary associations participating in the political process. But this, of course, gets it exactly backwards. We shouldn't be trying to think of ways to keep people from participating in the political process. We should be encouraging more of it. As veteran columnist George Will has noted, the political process is not some private club in which the parties and candidates control the membership. And yet that's precisely what the Disclose Act aims to do. Now, I know our Democratic friends are frustrated. Prior attempts to pass a constitutional amendment limiting political speech have failed spectacularly, hitting a high watermark of 40 votes in 2001. The Supreme Court has also spoken clearly and emphatically that under the Constitution, free speech isn't limited to corporations that own liberal media outlets. The purpose of the Disclose Act is to get around all of that. If the supporters of this proposal can't suppress individuals or groups, the thinking on the left goes, then they should just go after the funding that amplifies the message. And they'll do it in the old fashioned way through donor harassment and intimidation. We've seen this kind of thing before, my friends, perhaps most vividly in the 1950s when the state of Alabama tried to get its hands on the donor list of the NAACP. The Supreme Court knew what that was about, 
which is why they ruled against forced disclosure then. They knew that the, focused disclosure, the forced disclosure of donors mitigated against the rights of free association, because if people have reason to fear that their names and reputations will be attacked because of the causes they support, well, then they're less likely to support them, of course. And that's the last thing we should want in a free society. <clears throat> The FEC, interestingly enough, has applied this same principle, by the way, in protecting the donor list of the Socialist Workers' Party, which most of you probably didn't even know existed. The FEC has supported protecting the donor list of the Socialist Workers' Party since 1979. So we've seen what the loudest proponents of disclosure have intended in the past, and it's not good government. The president likes to say that the only people who oppose disclosure are people who have something to hide, History tells us otherwise. The sad fact is this kind of government-led intimidation is part of a much broader effort that's been underway within the Obama administration for years. We've seen parallel efforts at suppressing speech at the FCC, the SEC, the IRS, DOJ, and HHS. And the tactics we saw during the 2012 campaign speak for themselves. From the enemies list of conservative donors on the Obama campaign's website, to the strategic name dropping of conservative targets by the president's political advisors. And that's what this proposal is about. It's about harvesting the names of donors in the hopes of driving them off the playing field. We've seen it before and we're seeing it now. So let me just repeat today what I've said elsewhere on this entire effort. No individual or group in this country should have to face harassment or intimidation or incur crippling expenses defending themselves against their own government simply because that government doesn't like the message they're advocating. It's pretty simple, really. If you can't convince people of the wisdom of your policies, it's time to come up with better arguments. But tampering with our First Amendment rights is a dangerous business, and that's what this legislation before us aims to do. It's an unprecedented requirement for groups to publicly disclose their donors stripping a protection recognized and solidified by the courts. From the NAACP to the Sierra Club to the Chamber of Commerce, every one of them would now be forced to subject their members to the kind of public intimidation we've seen at other moments in our history. The authors of this bill have sought bipartisan cover for this latest effort by claiming that labor unions would also be required to disclose their donors under this bill. Upon closer inspection, however, it becomes clear that through a cynical and elaborate scheme of thresholds and triggers, these unions are given, of course, a free pass. And that just underscores who the true targets of this legislation are. The targets are anyone who criticizes Democrats. Which brings me to the final point. For four years now, we've heard how the Supreme Court unleashed a torrent of corporate money into the political process through the uh, Citizens United ruling. Well, here, here's the truth. Individuals from New York to California have given tens of millions of dollars to candidates and causes, as is their First Amendment right. But the big money, it turns out, is coming from the same unions that are exempted from this bill, which by one count have spent nearly four and a half billion dollars over the past nine years on politics, including 800 million in 2008 alone. So for those who want to, quote, do something, end quote, allow me to make a humble suggestion. Instead of suppressing free speech, let's look to state models for guidance. The endless web of campaign finance laws we've seen at the federal level have done nothing but sow confusion. But they've been good for one group. The election lawyers are doing great. A simpler, more reasoned approach would be for us to adopt the Virginia plan. Remove the limits, allow candidates to accept and report all contributions, and let the citizens decide what is proper or not. Money will never be removed from politics. It's just like trying to put a rock on jello. It just moves somewhere else. The intellectually honest approach is to remove the rock. So in closing, Mr. Chairman, I'll continue to do everything in my power to protect the First Amendment rights from this latest iteration of the Disclose Act and every other effort to suppress the free speech rights of the American people. And I sincerely hope my colleagues, all of whom swore the same oath to support and defend the Constitution that I did, will stand up 
The First Amendment undergirds all other rights. We need to defend it with everything we've got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McConnell. Senator Udall. Thank you, Chairman King, and it's good to see uh, my good friend Senator Whitehouse here, who has always been a champion of open and fair elections, and, and uh, I very much support his Disclose Act and hope that we can uh, move it forward. Um, we have a serious problem and a great challenge. Our campaign finance system is failing and is broken. It's being dismantled step by step by a narrow majority of the Supreme Court. <clears throat> Excuse me, taking us back to Watergate era rules, the same rules that fostered corruption, outraged voters, and prompted campaign finance regulations in the first place. From 1976 and Buckley versus Vallejo, when the court first tied campaign cash to free speech, to Citizens United, when the tortured logic reached its peak and corporations became people. The court's McCutcheon decision in April was the latest blow, further opening the floodgates for wealthy individuals to donate to an unlimited number of candidates. At this point, five conservative justices have said preventing outright bribery is the only legitimate basis for regulation. This isn't about free speech, and the American people know it. It's about wealthy interests trying to buy elections in secret with no limits, period. Because the speech we are talking about here isn't free, Citizens United and McCutcheon are not about the grassroots small donor. It's about the big guys, the really big guys, billionaires and millionaires. Political reporter Ken Vogel has come out with a book about the new era of campaign spending. He calls the book, and it's big money, he reports that outside groups, super PACs, and other independent out outfits spent $2.5 billion in the 2012 campaign. Open a newspaper. We are seeing more and more political coverage about which billionaires are spending tens of millions of dollars on the political system. This is all coming at the expense of middle class citizens and the challenges they face. It's a broken system based on a flawed premise that spending money on elections is the same thing as free speech. There are only two ways to fix this. The court overturns Buckley, which is not likely, or amend the Constitution to overturn previous misguided court decisions and prevent future ones. That is why I built on bipartisan efforts going back decades and introduced SJ Res 19 last June to restore the historic authority of Congress to regulate the raising and spending of money for federal political campaigns. This would include independent expenditures and would allow states to do the same at their level. It would not dictate any specific policies or regulations, but it would allow Congress to pass sensible campaign finance reform laws that withstand constitutional challenges. We are seeing momentum. SJ Res 19 was just reported by the Judiciary Committee last month. It now has 46 co-sponsors, and a companion measure has been introduced in the House with more than 110 co-sponsors. I will continue to push for a constitutional amendment. We need comprehensive reform, but the, in, the, in the interim, we also need to follow the money which is exactly <clears throat> what Senator Whitehouse and the Disclose Act intend to do. The Disclose Act of 2014 asks a basic and more, more than fair question. Where does the money come from and where is it going? The American people deserve to know who is spending all this money to influence their vote. And they deserve to know before, not after, they head to the polls. That's why the Disclose Act, that is what the Disclose Act will achieve. It is practical, sensible, and long overdue. We have a broken system. McCutcheon is the latest misguided decision. It won't be the last. Congress needs to take back control by passing a constitutional amendment. We all know that it will take time. In the meantime, the checkbooks will be out. The money will keep flowing. We should pass the Disclose Act.
Billionaires may keep spending, but they can't keep hiding. Americans are losing faith in our electoral system. There is just too much money hidden in the shadows. It's time to restore that faith. The Disclose Act is a step in the right direction. You know, it, it was um, <clears throat> said here several times over and over again uh, that somehow this is about uh, free speech. What Disclose is about is the basic core principle of the, the voters knowing where the money is coming from. Hundreds of millions of dark money, and I see a chart here on the table that I know Senator Whitehouse is gonna talk about. Hundreds of millions of dark money in 2012 and in 2010 are infiltrating the system. Nobody knows who gives that money except the billionaires and millionaires who are doing it. So thank you, Senator Whitehouse, for being here today, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman King, for um, holding this very, very important hearing on our democracy. Thank you, Senator Udall. We have two panels today. The first is uh, Senator Whitehouse, who's the principal sponsor of the Disclose Act, um, and uh, he has been involved in this issue for some years. Uh, and uh, Senator Whitehouse, uh, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman King and uh, Ranking Member Roberts, for convening this important hearing on the need for public disclosure of who is behind the funds raised and spent to influence federal elections. Not to silence or limit that speech, to be clear, just to have the public know who is behind the funds raised and spent to influence federal elections. I'm pleased to testify about the Disclose Act, which I introduced with 50 colleagues last month to end the toxic scourge of massive undisclosed spending in elections, a scourge that is undermining public faith in our democracy, happily for the special interests who want to pull strings behind the scenes and who profit from a discouraged citizenry. The Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision opened the floodgates to unlimited corporate spending in elections. Every day it becomes clearer that this decision will go down as one of the court's worst, like such discredited rulings as Lochner versus New York. Citizens United is so far the crowning achievement of a set of politicized activist judges who are acting to quote Justice Breyer, like junior varsity politicians. This term's McCutcheon decision, which struck down aggregate limits on individual donations, has compounded the need for this transparency. This year, the toxic influence of Citizens United can be seen in the country's most competitive Senate races. According to the Wesleyan Media Project, roughly 90% of all television ads in both the Michigan and North Carolina Senate races have been run by outside groups. Many of these independent groups mislead voters and give no clear idea of who is supporting or opposing the candidates. When groups can run ad campaigns without disclosing their true identities, they freely resort to vicious and dishonest attack ads with no fear of anyone being held accountable for those claims. The Disclose Act would help rein in what one Kentucky columnist has dubbed this tsunami of slime. The bill, which is unchanged from the version introduced in July 2012, would require organizations spending money in elections, including super PACs, and tax-exempt 501c4 groups to promptly disclose donors who've given $10,000 or more during an election cycle. The bill includes robust transfer reporting requirements to prevent political operatives from using shell corporations to hide donor identities. Provisions such as the high disclosure threshold protect membership organizations from having to disclose their member lists. 
and allow organizations to exempt donors who do not wish their contributions to be used for political purposes. We do have to do this together. We tried to get this legislation passed in 2010, and Republicans filibustered. We tried again in 2012, and again, Republicans filibustered. It will take Republicans to join us to get this done. There's a chance of that. It wasn't too long ago that Republicans supported disclosure. Here's what Republican colleagues have said about disclosure in the past. Quote, I don't like it when a large source of money is out there funding ads and is unaccountable, one said. As another put it, quote, I think the system needs more transparency so people can more easily reach their own conclusions. A third colleague summed it up nicely. Virtually everybody in the Senate is in favor of enhanced disclosure, greater disclosure. That's really hardly a controversial subject. Leader McConnell, back in the day, said virtually everybody in the Senate is in favor of enhanced disclosure. Public disclosure of campaign contributions should be expedited, he said, so voters can judge for themselves what is appropriate. They were right then, and Americans know it now. Americans of all political stripes are disgusted by the influence of unlimited anonymous cash in our elections and by campaigns that prize billionaire backers and secretive slush funds. We need to pull together and solve this. Passing the Disclose Act would at least make transparent the anonymous money pouring into elections and would signal the American people that Congress is committed to fairness and openness. As a Republican former Federal Election Commission chairman, Trevor Potter has said, this bill is, and I'll quote him, appropriately targeted, narrowly tailored, clearly constitutional, and desperately needed. In 2010, we came within one vote in this chamber of passing the Disclose Act. This year, let's redouble our efforts to contain the damage done by Citizens United with transparency. We must preserve government of the people, by the people, and for the people from this tide of unlimited, unaccountable, and anonymous money polluting our elections from this tsunami of slime. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Appreciate your testimony and appreciate your uh, sponsorship and uh, strong support of this uh, legislation. I'd like to ask uh, our second panel to take their seats at the table, please. Uh, We'll now hear from our second panel. First, Ms. Heather Gerken, who is the J. Skelly Wright Professor of Law at uh, Yale Law School and a commissioner on the Bipartisan Policy Center's Commission on Political Reform. And second, Mr. Bradley A. Smith, chairman of the Center for Competitive Politics. I see that Senator Schumer, the chair of the committee, has joined us. Senator Schumer. Yes. I was uh, going to congratulate Senator Whitehouse on his great work here. So I will do that and now turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll be you. back in a minute. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Daniel Tokaji, uh, the Robert M. Duncan Jones Day designated professor of law at The Ohio State University, Moritz College of Law, was planning to be here today, but a plane delay has kept him from uh, joining us. But his testimony will be inserted into the record. He will be, able to be available to answer questions uh, for the record. Uh, thank you both for joining us today, and uh, uh, I'd like to ask each of you to limit your statements to five minutes, uh, and then we can uh, ask questions, and I know that you have both submitted longer written statements, which uh, will be submitted into the record of the committee uh, without objection. Ms. Gherkin, could you proceed, please? You need to press the button, I think, to start your mic. Thank you very much, Chairman King and Senator Roberts. Robust disclosure mechanisms are an essential foundation for any campaign finance system, and ours are neither adequate nor effective. Dark money flows freely through the system and grows in significance each election cycle. 
The need for adequate disclosure mechanisms has become even more important as the Supreme Court dismantles much of our current campaign finance system, leaving American politics even more vulnerable to money's hidden influence than before. I want to make three points today. First, disclosure rules have garnered considerable bipartisan support, and with good reason. Disclosure sits at the sweet spot in policymaking where democratic idealism and political realism meet. These rules provide the American people with the information they need to make informed decisions without placing restrictions on where and how donors spend their money. As a result, outside of Washington's tight circles, transparency measures enjoy a high level of support among policymakers, academics, and the American people. As one of the 29 commissioners on the Bipartisan Policy Center's Commission on Political Reform, which was chaired by Senators Trent Lott, Olympia Snow, and Tom Daschle, Secretary Dan Glickman, and Governor Dick Kempthorne, I witnessed firsthand what happens when a bipartisan and savvy group debates about transparency. After a lively debate, the commission recommended the disclosure of, quote, all political contributions, including those made to outside or independent groups. And I would like to emphasize that it did so unanimously. My academic work has also convinced me of the importance of robust disclosure rules. What I have called shadow parties have emerged. Independent organizations like 501c4s and super PACs that exist outside of the formal party structures and closely cooperate with campaigns even if they do not, as a legal matter, coordinate with them. These shadow parties enjoy substantial advantages over the formal parties in terms of fundraising capacity, but many, specifically 501c4s, also offer donors another significant advantage, anonymity. These shadow parties are shifting the center of gravity away from the formal party apparatus into private and non-transparent organizations. An important report authored by Professor Tokaji and Renata Strauss offers compelling evidence of the new problems associated with this regime, and I'd be happy to discuss that during questions and answers. Second, transparency mandates stand on firmer constitutional footing than any other type of campaign finance regulation. Do not let cases from the 1950s when lynchings and murders occurred mislead you. While the First Amendment limits Congress's ability to regulate campaign finance generally, the court has concluded that transparency rules promote First Amendment values by providing Americans with the information they need to evaluate the ads that they watch. With the exception of Justice Thomas, the justices who are the most skeptical of campaign finance regulations generally have consistently voted to uphold transparency measures and have authored many of the touchstone opinions in this area. Finally, there are a variety of models for ensuring that disclosure requirements remain robust and efficacious over many election cycles. Wade Gibson, Webb Lyons, and I have proposed a new one aimed at the central problem in campaign finance law, which Senator Roberts mentioned, which is keeping up with the ever-changing strategies that donors use to conceal their influence. Whenever regulations make it harder for wealthy donors to fund politics through one outlet, they tend to find another. And Congress and the FEC have long struggled with this question. As each new election cycle, new organizations emerge. We think of it as the carnival equivalent of whack-a-mole. Our proposal avoids what Senator Roberts is worried about, which is the whack-a-mole problem, because it regulates the ad, not the organization. Rather than trying to guess, guess which organizations will emerge in the next campaign cycle, we offer a very simple fix. Any advertisement funded directly or indirectly by an organization that does not disclose its donors must simply acknowledge that fact with a truthful disclaimer. This ad was paid for by X, which does not disclose the identity of its donors. The fix is universal and flexible enough to accommodate changes in future election cycles, and because it offers universal disclosure, it guarantees that regulations will keep pace with politics. For all these reasons, now is the right moment for Congress to pass new disclosure requirements. This is one of the rare instances where the need for change is significant, the time is ripe, and the American people are ready. Thank you very much. Our next witness is uh, Mr. Brad Smith, Bradley Smith, who is the chair of the Center for Competitive Politics. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, we're delighted to have you here. I read your testimony in full, and I must say, uh, very impressive and, and uh, thoughtful testimony. I appreciate the, uh, 
the effort that you uh, have put forth to, to uh, discuss this issue with us. Mr. Smith. For your kind words there, I think we have this now. And uh, thank you, Senator Roberts, as well. Uh, let us start with a basic fact. There are currently more laws mandating public disclosure of politically related spending than at any time in our nation's history. None of these disclosure laws have been altered in any way by the Supreme Court in Citizens United, in McCutcheon, or in any other decision. Candidates, political parties, PACs, super PACs already disclose all of their donors and expenditures beyond the most de minimis amounts. Federal law also requires reporting of all independent expenditures over $250 and of all, quote, electionary communications of over $10,000, including the names of donors who contribute for those purposes. This information is all publicly available on the FEC website. 527 organizations that are not state or FEC registered PACs also report all donors to the Internal Revenue Service, which makes that information available to the public. Additionally, the FCC requires broadcast ads to include the identity of a spender to be made public within the ad itself and requires further information to be made available through the political file each station is compelled to maintain. Given this extensive disclosure regime, it is simply a misnomer to talk of dark money or non-disclosing groups. Rather, what we have is a system in which some politically related spending occurs with less information than some people would like about the spender's members, donors, and internal operations. Assuming that this is a problem, the question is how big a problem is it? The FEC reports that $7.3 billion was spent on federal races in 2012. Approximately $311 million of that was spent by organizations that did not itemize and disclose all of their donors. That is a bit uh, under 4.5% of total spending came from groups that did not itemize their donors. Um, <clears throat> even this number tends to overstate the issue because many of these groups are well known to the public, groups such as the League of Conservation Voters and the United States Chamber of Commerce. But some still ask, why not seek still more information? Why not dig further into the disclosure well? Well, there are several reasons. First, studies show that, compulsor, that compulsory disclosure disproportionately limits smaller grassroots organizations, particularly organizations that rely on volunteers. Second. And this is simply because of the regulatory compliance issues. Second, transfer provisions of the Disclose Act would create a fundraising nightmare for nonprofits, even those that do no political work at all, hindering general nonprofit social welfare activity in society at large. Third, the Disclose Act creates a great deal of junk disclosure. Much of the disclosure required by the Act would continually, would actually confuse the public. It would be unfair to persons who would have their names attached to speech they did not intend to or did not actually fund, and it would be misleading as to the amounts actually spent on political activity by requiring double, tripping, double triple, and even more frequent counting of the same money. Finally, we cannot overlook the cost and privacy that come with excessive compulsory disclosure, costs which have caused, led the Supreme Court to repeatedly strike down excessive disclosure laws, including in the 1970s, 1990s, and 2000s. Um, disclose, if passed, will certainly be challenged on constitutional grounds. But even if it were to withstand those challenges, this body should recognize and so show consideration for the privacy and other interests that would justify such a challenge. The purpose of disclosure is to allow citizens to monitor their government. It is not to allow the government to monitor the political activity of its citizens. As the ACLU has put it, absent anonymity, some donors on both the left and right will simply not donate out of the legitimate fear that they will be harassed or retaliated against for their advocacy. We cannot have a serious hearing here today without recognizing the cost that compulsory disclosure has for unpopular speakers and new, often unpopular ideas, ideas that may in later years become quite popular, as was the case with abolition or more recently same-sex marriage. The CEO of a consumer business in West Virginia or Kentucky who believes that coal should be more heavily regulated. The small town Alabama businessman who wants to fund a suit by the ACLU challenging prayer in the area's public schools. A Montana businesswoman who favors gun control. These people should not be compelled by the government to put forward information that will lead others to boycott them and destroy their businesses. Rightly or wrongly, and regardless of what some members of this panel may want to hear, millions of Americans already believe that their government is inappropriately spying on them. Tens of millions of Americans do believe, and I think there's enough evidence that this is hardly irrational, even if some think it is incorrect, that the IRS is being used as a tool to harass points of view that are critical of the current executive. There are millions of Americans who hear a senator publicly call for criminal prosecutions of political activity, and they see themselves as the intended target of that senator's wrath. 
Too often today, disclosure is not used to evaluate messages. Rather, uh, people admit that they openly hate the message and seek to use disclosure to stop the speech altogether. As one organizer stated a while back, years ago we would never have been able to get a blacklist together so fast and quickly. Thanks to compulsory disclosure in computers, it's much easier to blacklist fellow Americans than in the past, but many Americans will not see this as progress. Frankly, the approval of this bill is unlikely to improve trust in government precisely because many people do not trust the government now. If you wish to increase that trust and create a climate in which serious improvements, bipartisan improvements in disclosure laws can be considered, then you must at least appear to take seriously the fact that the Inspector General for Treasury has found that the IRS targeted speakers on the basis of their political activity, that the key IRS employee involved has pleaded the Fifth Amendment and suddenly lost a large cache of emails in what a poll shows substantial majority of Americans believe are uh, highly suspicious circumstances. We must stop proposing to amend the Constitution for what appears for, to millions of Americans to be nothing more than short-term partisan gain. And we must no longer tolerate the disgraceful ongoing vilification on the floor of the United States Senate of individual citizens because of their lawful political activity. In other words, if we wish to create improved trust in government and create a climate favorable to meaning and serious revision of disclosure laws, we must first act within this body to create a climate of trust. This bill is not helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. We'll have seven-minute rounds. Uh and uh, questions for both witnesses. Um, Ms. Gerken, you mentioned the NAACP case, and I believe Senator McConnell mentioned it as well, where the Supreme Court recognized in that case uh, the importance of protecting donor lists. Can you distinguish that case from the situation that we're uh, talking about here this morning? So it has always been true that the Supreme Court has made sure that there are protections for people who are likely to suffer a real threat of harassment. And the case involving the NAACP is, of course, the quintessential version of that. We all know what was going on in the Deep South in the 1950s. It was a dangerous time to be seen as donating and supporting the NAACP. The Supreme Court continues to reaffirm that precedent, so anyone who is concerned about this level of harassment need only show a reasonable probability of harassment. What we have not seen, however, is many people succeeding under these standards. The National Socialist Workers Party uh, has done so, but uh, in two recent high-profile cases, which are often invoked as examples of harassment, when federal courts look at the facts, they have concluded that that level of harassment is not actually a problem. People taking your signs off of your, your uh, doorstep and mooning on one occasion, um, someone does not constitute a sufficient harassment to, to undermine disclosure rules. And I should just note that oftentimes when people talk about what constitutes harassment, they talk about consumer boycotts. If we're going to talk about the civil rights movement, we should remember consumer boycotts have long been a robust and treasured tool tool of those who believe in the First Amendment and use their power as consumers in order to pursue their, their aims. So harassment of, of the sort that the National Socialist Workers experienced is grounds for suspending disclosure rules. Harassment of the sort that we've seen in recent years has not been. Thank you. Mr. Smith, you, you talk very movingly about the plight of the small donor, but doesn't this bill only apply to $10,000 and above? I, I'm not, I wouldn't call that necessarily a grassroots donation. Isn't there a distinction to be had? This, this, this bill, this before us, is a, has a $10,000 and above cutoff. It uh, doesn't deal with small contributions. Well, <clears throat> obviously most Americans cannot afford to contribute $10,000 to any type of cause. However, millions of Americans can and in fact do, and they often speak for other Americans of more modest means who share their points of view. And many of these people, I think, will be dissuaded from participating in the system. The academic literature is really pretty clear on this, that disclosure does dissuade people from spending. Not everybody, not most people, but it does uh, discourage some people from participating in campaigns. But what about the issue of information but part of the it goes back to the beginning of the country it goes back to the uh, to the to the statement that uh, Chief Justice Roberts made in McCutcheon that knowing who's doing the talking is part of the information voters need in order to assess the message isn't that a legitimate public interest I, I think that is and I think that's why we have as much disclosure as we have but 
the court has never approved, for example, has never given its blessing to something like this act. It might do so if given this act, but there's very good reason to think that it would not. Again, in Buckley v. Vallejo, for example, it vastly trimmed down the disclosure statutes in McIntyre versus Ohio Election Commission. And so I think that we cannot assume that the court is going to approve this, and there are reasons why uh, we should be hesitant about it. What we see more and more now is that, as I mentioned, people are not saying, boy, I need to understand this ad. Rather, people are saying, I hate that speech. I want to stop that speech. Uh, a group called Media Matters is out raising funds, specifically promising to distort and harass people's speech, i.e. their giving and the speech that it funds, in order to uh, gin up public bash backlash against them and, quote, dissuade them from participating. And I don't think Congress should be a party to forcing people to provide information that their political opponents will use to harass and vilify them and try to dissuade them from participating in democracy. Well, on the constitutional question, the, the the issue of disclosure was specifically endorsed very strongly by both Kennedy and, and Citizens United and Robertson mm -hmm. in in, uh, uh, in McCutcheon, and it wasn't a minor matter because uh, uh, Justice Thomas dissented on that issue. So it, it it's clearly looks to me like eight members of the Supreme Court have asked us to uh, enact greater disclosure requirements because that's the only thing left after they've dismantled the other, uh, the other protections. They've said it's okay that we're doing this because we have disclosure, which of course we don't. Well, I, I think that that would be something that you would undertake at your peril. Uh, I mean, they have not endorsed this particular item. What they have said is we have a disclosure regime and that is adequate. They have not said, if Congress did more, we'd have an adequate disclosure regime. They have specifically talked about what we have on the books um, and viewed that as significant enough. It is true, however, that I think the courts, let's put it this way, without those statements, I would tell you flat out, I think this bill is unconstitutional. Now, I can only tell you that there will be a serious challenge made to it. We should remember, though, that anonymity has a long history in the United States, from the Federalist Papers, uh, former Chief Justice John Marshall used to fund anonymous political speech, Thomas Jefferson used to fund anonymous political speech. Abraham Lincoln used to fund anonymous political speech. We know that now, only years after their death. And, and we should be aware that, again, you can uh, dissuade and discourage people from speaking, and, and we need to be sensitive to that. And I think at this point, we have a great deal of disclosure, and one of the reasons people are uh, hostile to the idea of extending it further is that they see this uh, as a partisan effort, and they see the IRS investigations, and, and they say, this is exactly why I don't want to disclose. I can assure you that this senator doesn't view this as a partisan issue. As I said in my opening statement, I think this is a democracy issue, and all we need is a couple of liberal billionaires to start spending in the way that others are, and suddenly you'd see a change in, in uh, the atmosphere around here. Uh, Ms. Gherkin, do you, Professor Gherkin, is this a... Uh, do, is there a disclosure problem? Mr. Smith makes the case that we really don't have a disclosure problem. We've got lots of disclosure. Uh, but what about what's been happening in the last five years? No, I, I appreciate Professor Smith acknowledging uh, what the court said in Citizens United. I have a lot of trouble imagining the court finding this type of regulation to be a problem because all it is doing is leveling the playing field. Right now, Super PACs and political parties have to do a great deal of disclosure. No one has suggested that this, this violates the First Amendment or burden speech unduly. Uh, and so now all we're doing is extending, um, all, all that the Congress is proposing to do is extending this idea to organizations like 501c4s. And it's incredibly important to, to do that. If you don't level the playing field, then as we have seen over time, the C4s will become increasingly important players because they offer something that no one else can offer, which is unlimited fundraising ability and anonymity in doing so. So this is, in some ways, the game of regulatory whack-a-mole. This is imperative. If you don't stop the money here, it's just going to keep moving into the C4s, which is exactly what we've seen between 2008 and 2012. The amount of money spent in the system by undisclosed dark money is roughly three times what it was before. So, so this is just simply extending a set of regulations that we've lived with for a long time that have never been subject to any serious constitutional doubt to the new organization on the block, which is which is spending money in a new way in campaigns. Thank you. Senator Roberts? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both uh, for coming and uh, for giving excellent testimony. 
Ms. Gergen, your testimony did not endorse the Disclose Act, or at least that's how I read it, but I think in terms of your commentary, uh, you probably support it. Uh, uh, do you endorse it? You know, I, actually, no one's ever asked me if I've endorsed anything because I'm not a senator. Uh, I, so I do think that, one, um, we need more disclosure rules for the 501c4s. I think, two, this act is constitutional. It's narrowly tailored and sensibly targeted at the right um, opportunities. Uh, so, so you I, support it? I, su I would support it. Okay. If I were in your shoes, I'd vote for it. Okay. Well, you're not in my shoes. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe yeah. one day. Yeah. Yeah. They'd be a little different shoes, uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> you like cowboy boots? Uh, I'm a New Englander. We do not wear cowboy boots. Yeah, that's, that's part of your problem. <laughs> your bio indicates you were a senior legal advisor to the Obama campaign in 2008, 2012. The president has been criticized for attending fundraisers in the midst of a number of international crises. Last week, he was in Manhattan to attend a fundraiser for a House Majority PAC. That is a super PAC dedicated to electing a Democratic majority in the House. The House Majority PAC is one of a number of groups that gets support from the uh, Democracy Alliance. Another group that gets support from the Democracy Alliance is the Scholars Support Network. You are a member of that, is that correct? That's right. Following its annual meeting at the Ritz-Carlton in Chicago this year, uh, Politico reported on a memo to the board of the Democracy Alliance that contained the recommendations on how to deal with media inquiries about the conference and its participants. This is what the memo said. As a matter of policy, we don't make public the names of our members. Rather, the memo went on, the Alliance abides by the preference of our members. Many of our donors choose not to participate publicly, and we respect that. The Democracy Alliance exists to provide a comfortable environment for our partners to collectively make a real impact." End of quote. Why would disclosure make some of the members of this alliance uncomfortable? So I actually don't know the reason for that. I'm simply one member of the organization. But I, I will just say that there is a fundamental difference between many of the organizations that we're, that we're talking about here and those that are trying to affect politics with large amounts of money. The right. reason would why you, Justice would Kennedy. You agree, would you agree this? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we've got four minutes here, although the chairman has been very uh, liberal with his time uh, allowance. Do you agree this desire to remain comfortably anonymous should be respected? I will say that if you are trying to use large amounts of money to influence politics, then you should do exactly what Justice Scalia says, which is to have the civic courage to have your name publicly listed. And so I am support, in support of this bill. And if, this, if the Scholar Strategy Network started to try to influence politics with large quantities of money, I would be in favor of disclosure. Does the Scholar Support Network publicly uh, disclose its donors? I don't, I don't actually don't think it does, but I don't know the answer to that question. As I said before, um, it is not trying to influence. Shouldn't that be respected? It isn't trying to influence federal elections. And if it were, this bill would ensure that it, in fact, disclosed all of the donors that were trying to do so. That's the key to this bill. This bill allows for the privacy of groups engaged in a variety of pu public-oriented activities right. to remain anonymous. But when they try to influence elections, that money and donor must be disclosed. And I support that heartily. I got it. As a 501c3, it is not supposed to engage in any political in any political uh, activity, is that right? A 501c3 has, there's a variety of requirements about 501c3s about what right. it means, but as a general matter, they're not, they're not supposed to. Well, how is it then that the Scholar Support Network has been supported by the uh, Democracy Alliance, which stipulates that each organization it supports be politically active and progressive? So the Scholar Strategy Network is a very simple thing. It is designed to do something that academics are very bad at, which is to figure out how to convey their ideas to the broader public and to policymakers. You have thousands of universities across the country generating good idea after good idea by people who barely go outside during the day, who have never talked to a reporter, who have certainly never spoken to a senator, and have no idea how to convey their ideas in a broader way. That network is designed to take a bunch of people who are basically nerds and help them figure out how 
how to convey their ideas to the real world. It's That's sort of a, a useful, sort of a nerd network. It's a nerd network, yeah. but it's it is a policy oriented network to get ideas that are already in the public arena to policymakers. That's a very. I have every confidence that the uh, chairman of the committee sitting to my right gets calls a lot from nerds and all sorts of other people. I do, uh, even in Kansas. University of Kansas, Kansas State, Wichita State University. We got a lot of nerds. I, and New England has nerds, don't they? I don't think there are any in Kansas. I, I, I can testify there are nerds in Kansas. What about the American Constitution Society? At the Chicago conference, it took credit for helping to make possible the Senate rule changes imposed by the majority leader that led to the confirmation of, quote, progressive judges to the D.C. Circuit. You have also been involved with the American Constitution Society, is that correct? Yes, I have. Do they, public dis do they publicly disclose their donors? I don't believe that they do, but they also, um, if the Disclose Act were passed, if they were engaged in using large sums of money to influence politics, they would be required to, to disclose their donors, and that would be a good thing for democracy. Well, my point is you would recognize the Senate rules changes and the appointments to the D.C. Circuit were somewhat uh, politicized. Would you agree with that? You know, in this world, almost everything is politicized, I suppose. I understand that. Would the Disclose Act apply to 501c3s? The Disclose Act is going to apply to any organization that uses money to influence uh, politics. If 501c3s are engaged in some politicking, then they do something very simple, which is they segregate their funds. This is a traditional strategy used by many organizations to keep separate these two kinds of donations. That means that donors, for example, who want to support the American Constitution Society's general activities can give money without having it go to politics. But if they want ACS, to use that money to influence politics, uh, to influence uh, the election system, then they have to have a segregated fund. That's a very simple, it's a simple and elegant solution to the kind of problem that you're describing here. I don't know. Oh, I've been informed here that it doesn't apply to C3s. So, um, should it? If, so this goes back to the real, if a 501c3 would like to start to influence, to do the things that are outside the usual ambit, and it starts to take in large quantities of money that are going to be used to influence elections, then it is going to have to, it's going to have to disclose those activities. It would pull its side outside of 501c3s, they'd become 501c4s, presumably. I think you're talking about a regulatory uh, morass, but that at any rate, thank you so much uh, for answering my questions. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, I understand a vote has just gone, and uh, Senator Schumer uh, wants to ha have a few words, and then Senator Cruz will adjourn to vote, and we will be coming back. You, you all will uh, uh, talk among yourselves while we go and vote, and we'll be back. If you can get this settled while we're gone, that would be good. Senator Schumer. Well, thank you. And first, let me thank Senator King. He's been chairing a series of hearings on this very important issue and done it in his able, fair, and independent way. So thank you very much. Um, first, I just wanted to note Senator McConnell came and spoke as a member of the committee and talked about being against the Disclose Act. Uh, I recall during the days when we debated uh, McCain-Feingold, uh, Senator McConnell was the leading advocate of disclosure and said that's what we should do. We should not limit contributions, but disclosure would be enough. And that was true of most of my colleagues who were opposed to McCain-Feingold from the other side of the aisle. And then, of course, now all of a sudden they're against disclosure, and I would argue that is for political advantage. There's no principled reason to be against disclosure. Um, uh, this is a democracy. Things are disclosed. Justice Scalia's statement makes the same. And I would just ask uh, my friend uh, Brad Smith, who I know has been involved in this in a long time and opposed Cain Feingold and every other uh, limitation on campaigns that's here, why wouldn't the same argument apply to voting? I vote. I get protested all the time. Some of those protests are pretty loud and noisy and raucous. Maybe we should keep voting secret, what our legislators do, because it might uh, intimidate them. How can you make the distinction between the two? Both are participating in the political process. The public has a right to know most for, eight, for, you know, for 200 years. It's been regarded as progress, that there's more and more openness in government. People decry 
closedness in government. In fact, there's a bipartisan bill coming about. I think Senator Cornyn is the Republican sponsor, along with Senator Leahy, to make government more, more open and available in terms of the bureaucracy. Um, it's, it's, it's just confounding and strikes me as perhaps self-interested that people are actually against disclosure. There are all kinds of arguments about limitations, what you should limit and what you shouldn't, and Senator Cruz and I have had an ongoing argument about the First Amendment in this regard. Um, that's not what we're discussing today, because clearly you would say there is no First Amendment block uh, or, or any sort of First Amendment right um, to not disclose, is that right? Do you, or do you think the First Amendment argues for non-disclosure? Yeah, well, we have a bunch of questions. Yeah, so you can answer them all. And, and I do want to say, by the way, and this is, uh, you and I have not been face to face in, I think, 14 years, but I still remember the great courtesy you showed to my children at a confirmation hearing 14 years ago, and I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Your kids you were cute about, then. Now they're probably grown up, right? Yeah, they, they are. They but are. they're still, to parents, they're always cute, right? That's right. Okay. Um, you asked about... Um, uh, voting to begin with. Yeah. And that draws, I think, what is a key distinction that we make at the Center for Competitive Politics. The purpose of disclosure is for the public to keep tabs on its legislators. Uh, so when legislators vote, of course, the public needs to know that. Uh, and that's why we support disclosure of contributions to candidates, parties, uh, and so on. However, when you're talking about citizens talking to other citizens, I'm less sure that there's a compelling government interest there. Of course, we note that another type of voting is entirely secret. You are not required to uh, uh, display your vote in any state in the United States anymore. Now, Justice Scalia doesn't believe that's a constitutionally protected right to a secret ballot, and I think he's got a uh, you know, solid argument there, but it's a policy matter, uh, whether it's constitutionally required or not, we've agreed that people should have the ability to keep their political views quiet. And that goes to the question when we talk about, you know, people are against disclosure. I think everybody is in favor, pretty much everybody, of some degree of disclosure. And the question is, what should be disclosed? And I think part of the colloquy between Senator Roberts and, and my colleague here uh, relates to the question of, of what should be disclosed. And Heather kept, would say, well, if, if they're engaged in, in political activity. But what is political activity? A great many C3 organizations, such as some of the ones Senator Roberts were discussing, do do things, are doing things. The American Constitution Society is clearly trying to affect how people think about political issues, and that may ultimately affect how those people vote. And when I was chairman of the Federal Election Commission, I used to note that if you tell me, you know, what groups you want to silence, I can come up with a neutral method that will get mainly those groups and not many. Well, why would friends. disclosure silence people? Well, uh, I studies mean, it, we're a democracy here, and you could you can always say that somebody could argue you're wrong, but that is not. I mean, if you that is the most slippery slope argument I've heard. It just says anytime someone thinks they might be intimidated, they don't have to disclose anything. Well, it doesn't necessarily go that far, but again, you might ask, why do we have a secret ballot? Why are the Federalist Papers published anonymously? Why has the Supreme Court, in cases like Buckley v. Vallejo, McIntyre v. Ohio Election Commission, Watchtower Bible and Tract v. Village of Stratton, uh, Thomas v. Collins, uh, repeatedly protected citizens' anonymity when engaged in various types of political activity. Studies do show that disclosure, mandatory compulsory disclosure, has a deterrent effect on some people but participating the in politics. Supreme Court, no, no court that I'm aware of has made the argument that uh, yeah. that any there's any constitutional requirement for that. Is that right? Well, I, I, the court has, has repeatedly struck down overly broad disclosure laws, whether it would strike this but down. not on a First a Amendment question. basis. But I, but I have to say, right? Senator, is that right? Not on a First Amendment basis? No, on First Amendment grounds. It has narrowed statutes or struck them down. And, and I have to say, Senator, that you yourself, when you earlier introduced a version of this act, you stated that the, quote, the deterrent effect should not be underestimated. So I think you do recognize that there can be oh, a deterrent I, effect. Let me tell you, I think it's good when somebody is trying to influence government for their purposes directly with ads and everything else. It's good to have a deterrent effect. If you can't stand by publicly what you're doing, then you probably think something's wrong. So, so uh, I don't when, think you're afraid of being protested or picketed. So or the author like of that. Common Sense, uh, the authors of the federal. Well, you know, we didn't have a democracy then. That, that's not fair. The British were running the show. Tom Paine was worried he'd be he arrested. We're not worried that you publish something here in America, you'd be arrested. 
Well, I can only, uh, again, go back to saying that a great many people feel that they have uh, fears of excessive disclosure, that the Supreme Court has well. recognized this in many, many contexts, including the context of political giving. And I think it's common sense to all of us that there are times when one would rather right. not have to be publicly right. identified with certain political views, such as, again, the examples I gave in my testimony, for example, a person, a small business owner in Kentucky or West Virginia who favors increased regulation of the coal industry might be very concerned about what that could do to his uh, business if yeah. he were to voice those views. Well, if he, but different if he gives money to a political campaign to influence the candidate. The disclosure here is not based on what we should know about the individual, but the effect of, on an elected official. And that's the distinction that but, I think you sometimes fail to but make. But if he gives money give to a political last word campaign, if time. he gives money to a political campaign, then it is disclosed. It's only we're talking about giving money to a nonprofit C4 at this point. Yeah. Okay. I want to thank the witnesses. We're going to be in temporary recess, and Chairman King will come back, and I guess Senator Cruz will come back. Thank you both. The hearing will resume. The uh, hearing of the Rules Committee on the Disclose Act will resume. Uh, Senator Cruz, uh, your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to say thank you to both of the witnesses for joining us today. You know, before we broke, I thought the exchange with Senator Schumer was actually quite revealing, where Senator Schumer asked Mr. Smith, well, gosh, why can't we restrict the freedom of American citizens? Because after all, when members of Congress vote, our votes are public. And I think that really reveals the issue here, that the votes of members of Congress are public because we are supposed to be public servants. We are supposed to be accountable to the American people. And indeed, what this effort is about and what much of the efforts of this senator is about is trying to have politicians hold the American people accountable, which is backwards from the way it's supposed to work. Jefferson famously said, when leaders fear the citizens, there is liberty. But when citizens fear their leaders, there is tyranny. We're just a few months away from an election, and so often Congress will devolve into the silly season, where you'll, we'll have a series of votes that are not intended to pass, but are intended somehow to be messaging votes because the majority party thinks it will be beneficial for the upcoming election. Related to this legislation is a proposal that has been voted on by the Senate Judiciary Committee that 47 Democrats have put their name to a constitutional amendment that would repeal the free speech provisions of the First Amendment. It is the most radical legislation the Senate has ever considered. In 1997, when the Senate considered a constitutional amendment along similar lines, then-Senator Ted Kennedy said the following, quote, in the entire history of the Constitution, we have never amended the Bill of Rights, and now is no time to start. I emphatically agree with Senator Ted Kennedy. Likewise, Senator Russ Feingold, not exactly a right-wing conservative, said the following, Quote, Mr. President, the Constitution of this country was not a rough draft. We must stop treating it as such. The First Amendment is the bedrock of the Bill of Rights. And he continued in 2001, I want to leave the First Amendment undisturbed. For 47 senators to put their name to a constitutional amendment that would repeal the free speech protections of the Bill of Rights is astonishing. And it ought to be disturbing to anyone who believes in free speech, to anyone who believes in the rights of the citizenry to express their views in politics. And Mr. Smith, I want to ask a question to you. At the Constitution subcommittee's hearing on that proposed constitutional amendment, I'm the ranking member on that subcommittee. The chairman is Senator Durbin. I asked Chairman Durbin three questions about the amendment that he had introduced. The amendment, by the way, provides that Congress can put reasonable restrictions on all political speech. 
I would note, by the way, the First Amendment right now does not entrust determinations of reasonableness to members of Congress. Congress thought the Alien and Sedition Acts were reasonable, and indeed the heart of the First Amendment is about protecting unreasonable speech, not reasonable speech. When the Nazis wanted to march in Skokie, Illinois, Nazi speech is the very definition of unreasonable speech. It is hate, hateful, bigoted, ignorant, and yet the Supreme Court rightly said the Nazis had a First Amendment right to express their hateful, bigoted, ignorant, unreasonable speech. And then all of us have a constitutional right, and I would say a moral obligation to denounce that speech. Because as John Stuart Mill said, the best cure for bad speech is more speech, not restricting it. So the three questions that I asked Chairman Durbin, as I said, do you believe Congress should have the constitutional authority to ban movies? Do you believe Congress should have the constitutional authority to ban books? And do you believe Congress should have the constitutional authority to ban the NAACP from speaking about politics? And what I observed is that for me, the answer to all those three questions is easy. Absolutely not in no circumstances. And yet, on the amendment that every single Senate Democrat on the Judiciary Committee voted for, Congress would have the constitutional authority to do all three of those. My question to you, Mr. Smith, is what is your view of the dangers of giving Congress the constitutional power to ban movies, to ban books, and to ban groups like the NAACP from speaking about politics? Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Uh, you know, I think the danger is obvious, and it goes to the core of why we have a First Amendment. And, and you've hit the point, I think, very well when you said, uh, you know, the precise idea of the First Amendment is to prevent Congress from deciding what's reasonable. There was a view that this was too dangerous a power to cede uh, to the government. Um, during the first panel, Senator Whitehouse mentioned that he didn't want to dissuade anybody from speaking. He just wanted to have people disclose their information. But if you look at, for example, this bill, uh, many parts of it require uh, t uh, regulatory regime that will dissuade people from speaking, including the possibility of prosecution if uh, people make mistakes in knowing what other folks they're going to give money to will do. Uh, and Senator Whitehouse has been very vocal in urging criminal prosecutions against political speakers. So, you know, I think the First Amendment is there precisely to say this is just too dangerous a power to give to the government. As Chief Justice Roberts said in the McCutcheon decision, the last people we want deciding, you know, who needs to speak more, who needs to speak less in a campaign, or what's reasonable regulation, are, is the government itself the people who have a vested interest in being returned to office? And as I've often pointed out, even assuming the good faith of all actors, if rules and regulations tend to favor the party in power and the incumbents, then they will remain in place. And if they tend to disadvantage those people, then they will be changed. So we don't have to assume bad faith to see the danger in giving government that kind of power. Well, and, and, and we have seen in the Senate Judiciary Committee there were some Democratic co-sponsors of the amendment who said it is not our intention to ban movies or ban books or ban the NAACP from speaking. And at that hearing I observed, this is the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate. The inchoate intentions of members of, the, of this committee that may be buried in their hearts are not terribly relevant when 47 senators are proposing a constitutional amendment to the Bill of Rights that would explicitly, under the language of the amendment, give Congress the power, and the amendment says, to prohibit speech from any corporations. Paramount Pictures is a corporation. Under the language of that amendment, you could prohibit Paramount Pictures from publishing a movie critical of a politician. Indeed, Citizens United, which is subject of so much demagoguery, was the federal government trying to find a movie maker who dared make a movie critical of Hillary Clinton. I think the movie maker has a constitutional right to do so, just like Michael Moore has a constitutional right to make movies that I think are pretty silly, but he's got a constitutional right to continue to make them for all time. As regards to books, Simon & Schuster is a corporation. Under the text of the constitutional amendment, Congress could prohibit Simon & Schuster from speaking, as the ACLU said. For those of you who are here today who may say, well, 
Cruz is a Republican. I'm skeptical of what Republicans say. If you're skeptical of what I say, perhaps you're not skeptical of the ACLU. The ACLU said in writing this amendment would fundamentally abridge the free speech protections of the First Amendment, and they said it would give Congress the power to ban Hillary Clinton's book, Hard Choices. There is a reason that I have referred to the proponents of this amendment as the Fahrenheit 451 Democrats, because they are literally proposing giving Congress the power to ban books. That ought to trouble everyone. And with respect to the NAACP, the NAACP and La Raza and the Human Rights uh, Campaign and Sierra Club and Planned Parenthood are all corporations, and they should not be prohibited from speaking. We should be empowering the free speech of the citizens, not empowering the IRS and Congress and government to silence and regulate the speech of the citizenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. As one of the sponsors of that amendment, I'm not sure we're talking about the same document because the one I sponsored talks about regulating campaign contributions. It doesn't talk about banning books or movies or in any way, other way abridge the free speech, but I'm sure that's a debate that you and I can have uh, at a later date. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Mr. Senator. Mr. Chairman, just in response to the, to the question you asked, I, I would note that the, the text of the amendment says, quote, Congress and the state shall have the power to implement and enforce this article by appropriate legislation and may distinguish between natural persons and corporations or other artificial entities created by law, including by prohibiting such entities from spending money to influence elections. And since book publishers are almost always corporations, under the explicit text of that constitutional amendment, Congress would have the power to prohibit corporations like Simon & Schuster from publishing books, which I would note is exactly what the ACLU said in response to it as well. And so that, that is the plain text of the amendment that has been introduced, and I think it is a very dangerous suggested addition to the Bill of Rights of our Constitution. A discussion which we shall undoubtedly continue at a later day. Thank you, Senator. Senator Klobuchar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Good to have you back, Ms. Gherkin. I remember the hearing that I chaired. You did a good job. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. You can say that now, I guess, at the hearing. That was a little joke, you know. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, good to be here. Obviously, Senator Cruz and I disagree, and I wanted to refocus this, first of all, on the bill before us, the Disclose Act, um, which uh, it's my understanding, having looked at these cases, the Supreme Court, the, the Roberts Court, actually anticipated uh, that uh, we might have some limits on disclosure and that those would not be disallowed. Is that right, Ms. Gherkin? Yes, in fact, I actually think it would be fair to say that Citizens United, at least, was premised on the idea that there would be adequate disclosure. So Justice Kennedy, the author of the opinion, notes that um, as long as you have adequate disclosure, you need worry much less about independent expenditures. What Justice Kennedy may not have contemplated was the possibility that $310 million in the last election cycle was being spent independently by groups that were not disclosing the identity of their donors. But Kennedy was absolutely clear that disclosure promotes First Amendment values, the ability of everyday people to make decisions to hold their representatives accountable. That is why disclosure rules are consistent with the First Amendment. So he specifically used the word disclosure rules in the opinion. He not only specifically used the words, he actually specifically affirmed them and rejected the kinds of challenges that have been levied against the Disclosure Act by noting that because disclosure rules are not stopping someone from spending their money um, and are not putting the kinds of hard caps on that you see in other parts of the campaign finance regime, that they are a subject to a much more generous constitutional mm -hmm. standard, that Congress has much more leeway to impose them precisely because they further First Amendment values rather than undermine them. Mm -hmm. And I, I bring this up because uh, Senator Cruz's um, long speech there was mostly focused on the constitutionality of this. And uh, first of all, he was talking about the amendment, which I support, and I'll get to that maybe a little later, but this is about the Disclose Act today. And that the court clearly contemplated that disclosure act, uh, that disclose rules, I'm not going to say this act, that rules could be constitutional. 
Yes, exactly. And, and if you begin to sort of think a little bit about the sorts of arguments that are being made against the constitutionality of this provision, of this act, they would, I would think, also prevent you from um, regulating super PACs and the political parties. That is, there are all sorts of instances where we require donors to have the civic courage to acknowledge that they have given money to support a political candidate or uh, influence elections. And that's all that the Disclosure Act does. It levels the playing field subjecting C4 organizations, which have become immensely powerful in the elections process, to the same kinds of regulations we see for super PACs and parties. Which have been allowed as reasonable limits in the past. I, I mean, the, the statement, the um, kinds of arguments that would be made um, that would, would knock those down are so radical that, that eight That you wouldn't nine, be able, to, that, that they couldn't uh, go after you for yelling fire in a theater. I yeah, suppose. well, I will just say that, that um, the First Amendment law that exists on the books, written by the justices who have been the most skeptical of campaign finance regulations, have, with all but one exception, eight of them have affirmed these kinds of disclosure roles, and with good reason. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, then let's go from there. Um, the, what I'm concerned about here, and I've talked about it when you were here, I've talked about it at the Judiciary Committee, uh, is just the fact that, in fact, uh, the situation we have now with these hundreds of millions of dollars drowns out the speech of uh, regular people. Um, so that they can't speak because they're not going to be able to have a voice uh, if you have a regular person running for office that basically can't bring in millions into the campaign, has to raise money. Let's say they do what they're supposed to. I know what this was like, calling, 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 raising $500, raising $1,000. And then all of a sudden, someone could just come in and plow in hundreds of millions of dollars, or in the case, I think, of some of these recent races, 25 million so far, uh, against individual candidates, to the point where it almost becomes ridiculous for you to raise your own money, because you could be plowed down and stamped on by this outside money. And so the purpose of this bill uh, is to simply make sure that we have adequate disclosure to know that money's coming from to give that person an adequate fighting chance to say, look who's funding the attacks against me. Is that right? Yes. In fact, a lot of my research has been on, on what I call the rise of these shadow parties, these, these organizations outside the formal party structure, which are having an increasingly large influence over the elections process. And the trouble with shadow parties is that unlike your party, and unlike the Republican Party, they are not open to average and everyday people. That is, the price of admission to a, to a 501c4 is money, 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 and more money. Um, that means that the everyday people who inhabit our parties, who the, the, the party faithful and the voters, are losing the chance to influence the shape of the political process precisely because all the power is moving in the direction of the shadow parties. This is a step toward halting that flow. It won't fix it entirely, um, mm -hmm. but at least that will, will do something to help us hold, hold these groups accountable. Uh, one of the things that the Supreme Court pointed to in its recent McCutcheon decision was that now more things are online for people to take a look at. Uh, they may be true, but as you know, not everything is written online. It's very hard for people sometimes to find things. Um, do you think that improving the technology that we use for disclosing money, this is outside of the this, part of the Disclose Act, but not in the bill, in elections would help make it easier for groups to report on this and for the public to know what's really happening. I think that anything that can be done to make it easier in the public to figure out the source of an ad is, is helpful, um, which is one of the reasons why we made the proposal that we did, that for ads that are that are essentially paid for by groups that don't disclose their donors, that should be on the ad, mm -hmm. because citizens have a right to know who's behind the money. And I will say that for the average citizen, even the system we have now requires an inordinate amount of work for them to figure out uh, who's behind some of these ads and who isn't. So yes, anything that we can be done, um, both in terms of putting labels on the ads and increasing um, uh, the transparency of the way money flows through the system mm -hmm. is a good thing in my view. Yeah, I totally know this because even though I haven't had a lot of independent ads run against me, they've had issue groups do it sometimes. I've tried to figure out who's financing when my name is in it. And I can't figure it out. Yeah, no, I actually once made a joke in my election law class that, um, that you could have a group called Americans for America. And, and then one of my students proposed, I don't know if this is true, that in fact that group exists. So you never there you know go. who's behind it. Um, so one of the things that's intrigued me with this is that uh, this just hasn't been a partisan issue in the past. People have come together on uh, trying to find a way to uh, regulate uh, campaign contributions, understanding that it becomes actually corrupt when there's so much outside money and people can't tell where it's coming from. And I truly believe the integrity of our electoral system is at stake. Uh, and uh, for what I'm seeing, uh, there is bipartisan support in the public for doing something about all this outside money, but we're not uh, seeing it here. Um, why do you think that is? Um, how do you think we can change that? 
Well, I do think that there is actually genuinely bipartisan support. The American people overwhelmingly favor transparency. I also think that um, when you move a little bit outside of, of Washington, you find that um, people on both sides of the aisle are in support of transparency. Certainly when McCain-Feingold was debated, um, virtually everyone on both sides of the aisle was in favor of transparency. And I uh, had the pleasure of working on a commission with Senator Trent Lott, uh, with, with Representative Henry Bonilla, with Senator Olympia Snow, and we we unanimously decided to endorse transparency rules for independent funding. And in, in many ways, I think the one way to understand what that commission's purpose was, was to think about the relationship between elections and governance, because governance is breaking down in Washington. And they, uh, the group as a whole, was deeply concerned with that. Transparency and rules are part of what makes governance work. It helps the American people hold their representatives accountable, and it helps us all figure out where the money is flowing and how power is working in Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Smith, um, you know, I was one of the witnesses that we had at the Judiciary Committee was actually, I, I pushed him a little, and he said, um, when the, remember, this is not about the Disclose Act, this is about the um, constitutional amendment that Senator Cruz was referring to, and he basically said he thought we shouldn't have any limits at all on any kind of limits on contributions. Do you share that view? Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, Let's put it this way. Um, I think we should have good, reasonable limits on contributions. The current limits on contributions are substantially less than what they would be had they even been raised for inflation since they were first enacted in 1974. And it's worth noting that prior to 1974, we never had any limits on direct contributions by individuals to campaigns. Individuals up to 1974 were free to contribute $20 million directly to a campaign mm -hmm. if they wished to do so. Several states still allow that, and there's no, uh, nothing that indicates to me that it's had detrimental effect. In fact, those states consistently rank near the top of the best governed and least corrupt states in America. So I guess the better question to me would be, uh, you know, what really, how strong is the justification for limits, especially limits at the low levels that we have them now? When people ask me, to, you know, would I do away with all limits? I guess I always say, uh, you know, I might, but look, I understand why people want limits. Uh, I think what we need are more reasonable limits. That would be a good starting place. But you think it would be, con it's constitutional to have those limits in place? Well, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said that it's constitutional to have mm -hmm. uh, limits on contributions. Uh, right. There are several justices, uh, both now and, and former justices, who have disputed that, but it has never been a majority position on the court. Mm -hmm. And then do you think there's a constitutional issue then with actually disclosing the names of those people, that there's limits? They are disclosed. I mean, if mm -hmm. you give money to a campaign, your name is disclosed. But you have and an I issue think, with the Disclose Act then? Yes, I do, questions? because I mm -hmm. think we need to recognize first, Robert's court has not said that rules like this are constitutional. It has said it has been generous toward disclosure. It has never ruled on rules like this. In Citizens United, in McCutcheon, it is ruling against a background of existing disclosure rules. And as I mentioned in my prepared testimony, we have more disclosure now than at any time in American history. And the court has looked at that and said, this is the solution, this is adequate. It should not be read to suggest that the court is saying, go ahead and do whatever things more you want to do. Well, what uh, is so wrong with disclosing the people that give these kinds of contracts? Well, the question again. Why would that make it different than the other rules? The question is who or what is going to be disclosed. For example, this act does not require disclosure by the American Constitution Society of its donors. Uh, maybe it should. The American Constitution Society would escape it because it's a C3. It doesn't engage in a certain type of political activity. But anybody who says that it's not out there trying to influence politics is not serious. I mean, that's what a lot of groups do. So again, the question is not that people are opposed to disclosure as if this is some clear, obvious thing. The question is what should be disclosed, right, when and how and to what extent do we want to tie our system up trying to get you know the last little bit of, of disclosure out of the system. 501c4s have long done very, very hard-hitting issue ads. Uh, the NAACP ran ads in 2000 that reenacted the lynching of a man named James Byrd and the narrator specifically blamed it on then uh, Governor George W. Bush. It ran these ads in October just before the election. They didn't disclose their donors. Nobody got upset about it at the time. This is not something new, 
in that respect. It's not new since Citizens United. It's only been viewed as a crisis, so to speak, since Citizens United. And I think that really is a reaction to Citizens United rather than a serious, you know, reevaluation of the need for added disclosure in this area. So, you know, again, my organization and I have supported disclosure. I've supported it in my academic writings. But it's a question of what should be disclosed and how much. The Supreme Court has not endorsed all disclosure. In many cases, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, it has protected the right of citizens to engage in political activity anonymously, and nothing in Citizens United or McCutcheon overrules any of those decisions. Um, do you have um, concerns that once, you know, we don't know where this money's coming from because it's not disclosed that you could have foreign money come in when we don't know what the money is? And we well, you could have foreign it. money come in anyway. People just wouldn't have to, they wouldn't report it, they would lie yeah, about but it. If they, they, they wanted to, to break the law, it, they'll break the law. You can add it up and see what it adds for. It would take another step if you made up where the money was from. And uh, this time you would at least be able to know right. where it was from. Right. Well, as I pointed out, uh, it's about 4% of the money that is not itemized by donors that is uh, in the system. And, and so I think we need to keep that in perspective. And I think the end result is I think that one could consider changes to disclosure rules, uh, and there may be some things that we would want to do. But I think that this bill in particular has a lot of problems. Again, as I point out, it brings up what we call junk disclosure, double counting of funds, uh, relating people to money that they did not give for purposes of advertising, uh, uh, misdirecting the public about who is giving, in fact, or, or who is not giving. And so I think that we need to be conscious of the fact that this is simply not a good bill on its own technical merits. But I think also, as we design bills, we need to be conscious of the fact, and I think the data supports this pretty clearly, that excessive disclosure discourages honest, good political participation. And we need to be careful about that and sensitive to that reality. And it can be misused in the same way that anonymity can be misused when people intentionally say our goal is going to be to smear and attack uh, people based on political activity they might be vaguely related to through some financial transaction. Okay. Ms. Gherkin, do you want to respond? Well, so I just I want to um, agree with Professor Smith that the Supreme Court said what it said about disclosure when it robustly uh, and, and emphatically affirmed the validity of disclosure rules. It did it against a background in which we super PACs are regulated, political parties are regulated in the same way um, that, that 501c4 organizations would be regulated going forward. They are the outlier. All that this bill does is pull 501c4s into the ambit of the kind of disclosure rules that we've had right. for a very long time without anyone worrying about the First Amendment or um, suppressing yeah. it. Yeah, I just think it so much weighs on the side of getting this disclosed. And this is just from my own. It's, you know, I'm not the constitutional expert that you two are. It's just based on my practical experience. I remember when I had a $100 contribution limit in local office. That's what we had in non-election years. So like uh, six of my election, six of my years out of eight, I had a $100 limit on contributions uh, during the eight years that I was county attorney. I would still get numerous contributions for $99 uh, because then people knew that their name wouldn't be out there. And okay, maybe that's okay when you're dealing with $99, $100, but when you're dealing with the millions of dollars we're looking at here, I just don't think it's okay. It is a difference because of the impact that that extra money can have. And the outsized impact when you look at what individuals can give in an individual race, so you can get a max of what, 5,000, and a lot of the contributions I get are like 1,000, and then someone coming in with 25 million against you, and then you can't tell who those people are. Well, so. and Senator, I, uh, Professor Takaji is not here to talk about his report, but it really provides compelling evidence that, that, uh, that the numbers here um, are, are important, but what is more important is the way it's changing the political landscape. There's $310 million. There's complete agreement that at least that amount of money was not disclosed in 2012. But the way that it is changing how people run their campaigns and work with these shadow parties is quite astonishing. They're, they're, the, the parties are becoming more sophisticated. This is looking a lot more like what anyone in the world would call coordination except for a few lawyers. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it's becoming an increasingly worrisome prob problem, and it's hard to imagine 2016 is going to be any better. Right, and the last thing I would say politically, as like the chairman, as someone who likes to get things done and try to find some common ground, I just think this money in these extreme forms from the outside isn't going to foster that at all because people aren't, they're going to know something's going to hit them that'll just outweigh all that money that normal 
people give you at $100 or $500 or $50 or $20, it'll just be outweighed by some interest group who doesn't agree with you on one issue or that you haven't towed the party line on one thing, either right or left, and that money's just gonna come in and blow you out. And that's why I think that in the end, not only is this bad for just the traditional idea that we should know who's giving money, I just think it's bad for our democracy in terms of getting things done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Just a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, it occurs to me, Mr. Smith, that the, the reality, and, and this is a change that's happened almost overnight, really, in the, just in the last few years. Yes, there were 501c4s back along, and uh, but, but the, I would argue that the quantitative change equals a qualitative change. And what we have now is it's like the legends of the Trojan War where the, the, the Greeks and the Trojans fought each other but the gods were fighting in the skies. We have parallel universes of, of campaigns and it's getting to the point where the candidates themselves are the little guys and the real fight is, among, is between the billionaires uh, who, who, are, who are controlling it. And we've had for 100 years various kinds of controls that have come and gone, but it's all be been because of scandals and the danger of corruption that people have recognized since Teddy Roosevelt. That hasn't gone away. Human nature hasn't changed. And it just seems to me that all we're talking about here, and you yourself have said we've got lots of disclosure, and I would agree that we do, except in this one area. And you've indicated you think it's only 4%, but you're counting as, I think, as I carefully read your testimony, you're counting as disclosure when a group is listed Americans for Greener Grass as the contributor. That's disclosure. That's not disclosure. Disclosure is knowing who gave the money to Americans for Greener Grass. So I, I think you're, you're, you've, uh, the 4% the number, if it were true, we wouldn't be wasting our time here. But the truth is there's a ton of money coming in, it's accelerating, and all, I think most of us have said, okay, the court has said what they've said, and those are the rules about campaign finance, but they've, the only tool they've left us is disclosure. And, and it, it seems to me, and you talk about, well, it's, you know, there could be harassment. I think Justice Scalia said it very well. This is part of civic engagement. And if a billionaire can spend millions of dollars uh, attacking my record or my character, I at least ought to have the opportunity to know who it is. That, that it, it just, I, to me, it's just, again, I go back to the New England town meeting. No one's allowed to speak in a main town meeting with a bag over their head. Who the speaker is is part of the information, and that's the purest form of political speech in our country today. I just, give me your, give, give me your thoughts. I mean, all we're talking about, I think uh, Professor Gherkin is right, we're talking about applying to the, to the C4s and whatever their, the next, iteration is, the same rules that we've had for years where if somebody contributes to my campaign, if it's a hundred bucks, I got to list their name, address, phone number, occupation, but then somebody can spend $20 million and have no idea who they are, where they're from. Right. Um, no, I think, I think those are all good points. Let me, let me try to address those in, in some order that may not correspond to the, their importance or the order in which you raise them. But first, let's note that uh, I think that the McCutcheon decision, if, we're, if that's the concern, is actually a, a good decision in that, again, McCutcheon allows more money to flow directly into political I campaigns. Understand. That may actually diminish disclosed. the pressure toward these on... on uh, yeah, I don't see it having a major effect, but I do see it having some effect there. And I think along with that, as I noted earlier in response to Senator Kobusher, that, that, that uh, we have not raised uh, contribution thresholds to anything close to what they would be, even if adjusted for inflation. And in my view, they should be substantially higher than that, that inflation adjustment. And that would also, I think, uh, relieve some of the pressure on office holders fundraising and help to make them, again, more important in their own races, so to speak. This is a self-inflicted wound when I hear office holders uh, complaining about this. Now, you make a good point. Uh, you know, things change, right? And people change and how things operate change. And, and there's no doubt that is true. All I can say is that 
Uh, I don't think there's much evidence at all that these campaign finance, this web of regulation we've thrown over political activity, mainly since 1974. Before that, the laws were pretty easily evaded. There were very few little enforcement. Um, I don't think there's much evidence that it has helped. And if we look at states that are deregulated versus states that are highly regulated, there's little evidence that the latter group performs better in almost any measurement you choose, educational attainment, personal income, unemployment, almost any measure of government policy effectiveness you might want to come up with. Um, and in those old days, we always heard the same sort of stories. It's just not like it used to be. You know, the, in, in the 1920s, the parties were complaining about the expense of getting radio into everybody's house. And in the 1850s, they were complaining about, oh, ever since Van Buren, we have to do all these pamphlets and so on. And they've always been raising those kinds of issues. But there are other ways in which society has changed. For example, it used to be if you wanted to see disclosure reports, somebody had to go down and manually look them up. Nowadays, you can sit on the computer, pull up your neighbor's finances. There there are sites that directly link giving to people's, to maps to people's homes. What is the purpose of that other than intimidation? And we should be aware that there are increasingly groups out there, uh, Media Matters is one, there are several others, one called Accountable America and so on, that are very open about wanting to harass and vilify people. Now, Justice Scalia is being quoted all the time by people who never would quote Justice Scalia for anything else, right? Well, I think Justice Scalia is wrong here. I mean, if this is true, how did America survive until 1974? It's pretty hard to figure out. Why do we have the secret ballot, right? So again, the question is not, you know, do we oppose disclosure? No, we don't oppose disclosure. What we want to keep reminding ourselves is our purpose is to allow the people to keep tabs on the government. It's not necessarily let the government or let candidates keep tabs on the people. And while those can often are intertwined in a way that can't be separated, I think if we start with that premise in mind and we are sensitive to honest concerns about harassment, then I think we might have some room to devise more effective disclosure rules that would get at some of the issues uh, that seem to spur interest in the Disclose Act. But what I'm not seeing in this act and what I'm not seeing in the public statements I've heard about, and I don't mean in this room today or anything, I mean generally when I hear it talked about in the press, is any sensitivity to those kinds of issues or to why some people might fear government or unofficial retaliation and why those concerns are illegitimate. I think they are legitimate. Uh, the people give anonymously for all kinds of reasons. People give to hospitals anonymously, right? And I think we need to respect that. To have the government compel people to disclose information on themselves is not something we normally do. It needs to be carefully done and with a strong rationale behind it. I wouldn't disagree that there aren't issues in, in that regard, but it's, it seems to me it's a balancing case, a balancing test of trying to weigh the public interest in uh, knowing who's trying to influence their vote uh, and also the corruption issue against the dangers of intimidation. And uh, uh, this is, I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Scalia on this, although I don't agree with him on, on uh, Justice Scalia uh, on everything. And so that we can end on a point of agreement, I agree with <laughs> your statement there up until the point of Justice Scalia, but I think obviously the, the devil is in the details. Well, I want to thank both of you uh, for your testimony, and uh, uh, I want to thank you for your, the thoughtfulness with which you've answered the questions and the work that you put into the testimony that you presented to this committee. This is an important issue. Uh, it's one that isn't going to go away. Uh, and I believe that it's going to continue to uh, bedevil us uh, for some time unless we can find uh, some uh, resolution. Uh, so again, uh, I appreciate uh, your joining us, uh, and on, that's on behalf, on my behalf and on behalf of the committee. This concludes uh, the second panel of today's hearing without objection. The hearing record will remain open for five business days for additional statements and post-hearing questions submitted in writing for our second panel of witnesses to answer. I want to thank uh, Senator Klobuchar, the other senators who participated today, and uh, there being no further business before the committee this morning, this hearing is adjourned.